really delighted and honored to have Ann Madden who, with us, who just uh, uh, made her second TED Talk, which hasn't well has not aired. The first one is already available. So I, some of us have seen it. Second one will come whenever it comes, whenever they 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 publish it. Just and also just came back from a symposium uh, in in Oxford. So she's been making the rounds, uh, talking about about all the different worlds of micro microorganisms that she's involved with. And today she's going to talk about you know the 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 uh, what is it unusual unusual microorganisms found in strange places. So thank you, Ann Madden. Thank you. I think I want to start by speaking on behalf of science that we don't want to be dream killers because I think that's how I was just described. But rather, we're meant to, to collaborate in the adventure that is bread and other things. Um, Peter, thank you for mentioning the other talks. I promise you guys are my favorite. It has the best food thus far. So when we want to talk about what the future of science might hold for bread, I think the best way is to go back to the past, and specifically to think about the early 1500s in England. And I want you to imagine that that's where you are, and this is your life, and this could be your kitchen. And if I was to ask you, what's your favorite vegetable or fruit, the one that you find to be the most luscious, you might answer me with, Cabbage. This has nothing to do with your inherent love of cabbage or the properties of cabbage, but more about what vegetables and fruits that were accessible and that you'd experienced then. You hadn't yet lived in a world where there were mangoes available, or creamy coconuts, or the potato, or chocolate. You might think that cabbage was as good as it was going to get for veggies and fruits because it's hard to know what we're missing. So now we live in 2017, and we're in the United States, and we have a great number of vegetables and fruits that we have access to. But for breads, I think we're kind of in the early 1500s England. There are wonderful breads available to us, but there are better future breads, and those are going to be brought to us not by new plant species that are discovered, but by new microorganism species. So you know, this is a horrible oversimplification of bread. Um, but at its base, bread is water, grain, a little bit of salt, and yeast. And the yeast and the baker works together to make this amazing thing that we call bread. But often yeast aren't given the credit that they deserve. Because yeast can do more in bread than just make bubbles and make dough rise. They're in charge of some of the aroma compounds, how well the dough freezes, the firmness of the bread, the flavor, crumb structure. So much of bread is the result of that yeast. And there are different species of yeast, and different species produce different flavors or different traits. And this is just like how plant species can produce different flavors and traits in their different fruits. This is how we get an apple that tastes very different from a pear. You and I, we live in a world with about a thousand species of yeast, if not more, and many, many hundreds of more subspecies. And yet all of the breads that we've experienced in our life, they probably only came from a handful of yeast species. So why is this? Why do we use so few species? Why do we sit in our corollary of early 1500s England and never dream of mangoes or chocolate? Well, probably two reasons. One could be old assumptions. So as Stefan so wonderfully mentioned the other day, with the Industrial Revolution, there was this optimization of yeasts. We used the great workhorses of yeast now, but during this process, we might have gone under the assumption that we've, we've got the best yeast available. There are no better yeast species out there. We're, we're using the best ones. The other part is that we might have been lacking tools. Yeast exists all over the world, but they're a little bit of a mysterious creature. Sometimes they're hard to trap, and even if you can trap them, they're hard to grow into pure cultures that you can then use repeatedly every single time. 
Also, it's been hard to optimize which yeasts exist in the world. If you're faced with hundreds of thousands, it's hard to make breads from all of them and determine which one is your favorite. So I'm a scientist, and I work in the lab of Rob Dunn at North Carolina State University. And there, along with teams of others, we're interested in challenging the assumption that we're using the best yeasts in the world to make breads. And we're also developing new tools and strategies to try and harness these yeasts from nature. So for today's talk, we can think about this in terms of our exploration into wild yeasts and the mysteries of microorganisms by looking in expected and unexpected locations. You can think about this as the strange places or the less strange places. So the first place that we look is the unexpected locations. And in fact, in nature, we go to perhaps the last place you'd imagine if you were after something yummy and wonderful related to food. We go to pests, specifically <coughs> bugs, wasps, hornets, ants. Many insects in our world are reservoirs of wild yeast. They hold within them many of the yeast that make wine and many of the yeast in nature that have valuable traits. But the thing about insects are that each one of them contains a microscopic jungle. They contain many more things than just yeast. This is a picture of a petri plate with just one insect ground up. You can see hundreds of species. There are many thousands that exist in every bug. There are wonderful yeasts in here, but there are also pathogens. There are things that you don't want to grow. And so part of our issue became in how do we take this microscopic jungle and get just those yeasts that are of interest, that are valuable. And this is where we use a new approach. We developed a pipeline that's a strategic pipeline for discovery and evaluation. It's metabolism-centric. And by that, I mean that it's based on the traits of the yeast, not just who the yeast are, but what they can do. We use our understanding of ecology and evolution and then perform genetic, physiological, and chemical tests in order to optimize those yeasts so that we start out with many, many yeasts. And at the end, we have just a few that we can use for piloting in different projects. We've used this discovery pipeline for different tasks of interest, different challenges in the food and beverage world. And so the first time that we used it, we were after brewing yeast. And by using this pipeline, we were able to find a new species of yeast that had never been used for commercial beer brewing. And we found that it could make a sour beer in record time and without lactic acid bacteria. So if you're a sour beer fan, you know that it usually takes a year, six months, often longer to make a good sour beer, and that it results in the community of microorganisms. But here we found a yeast that could do it all alone. As of about a year ago, this would be considered somewhat impossible for a yeast to do. It's because we always think that yeast aren't good enough at what they are. They really are. So then we used this pipeline strategy for discovery, and we turned it towards bread. Could we find yeasts that would make different bread flavors, different bread aromas? And we developed a yeast library. Many of these yeasts have different flavor profiles, and many of them will create leavened bread, just the same as active dry yeast, but will produce fruity or floral aromas. When we had a certain test group smelling the different breads, they said that we'd forever ruined their experience with store-bought bread because the active dry yeast they used afterwards was meh. We also find yeasts that are fast acidifying, meaning that they can create a sourdough without lactic acid bacteria, without a community. What I love, I think, most about these is that each one of these yeasts has a story. And so the pink one up there, it comes from a little sweat bee that feeds on orange flowers. The white one up to the right, a little over, it has a smell that's 
almost like a melon. And it comes from a place in, I think it's Maine. And so finally, we have yeast that have a local story, the same way that we have for grains. As a microbiologist, I love this because I'm excited in finding new truths and to discover new creatures, and that's excellent. But there's something about food microbes, microbes that make food, that I think really unite people. Because I used to work with the plague and anthrax. And, right. So I work with that, and I tell people, I'm like, ah, oh, I work with MRSA and anthrax, and they don't want to shake my hand. I tell people that I work in like bread and beer yeast, and they're like, oh my gosh, I homebrew. Let me tell you all about it. I bake breads, um, particularly with sourdoughs. That's where I will have people go on. They're like, I have Herman. Herman's 150 years old. I love Herman. Herman gets fed three times a day. It took me a long time to understand that this was a sourdough starter and not a member of the family. <laughs> and so this is great. I mean, I love being able to interact with a microbial product the way that we all have here. It's not a Petri plate that you hold far away and sort of open up and get the smell of. It's a piece of bread that you just, I love the way people smell bread here. It's, it's just in your face. It's wonderful. And so the second part, the second part of the talk I'm going to mention is about capitalizing off of this enthusiasm that people have for these microbial products. And that's where we turn our research lens onto looking in expected locations. So not just trying to harvest the wild yeasts that have never touched breads, but looking to breads themselves. Here, we look at sourdough, and we engage the public in that enthusiasm they have for their little sourdoughs of Herman and all of the amazing names that I can't think of right now, but that are quite adorable. As everyone here in this audience, I'm sure, knows, sourdough is a little bit different. Um, unless you're using the bug yeasts, they require a community of microorganisms, lactic acid bacteria, oftentimes many species, and then yeasts, again, sometimes multiple species. Sourdoughs, as we've heard yesterday, are a bit of a mystery. Even though they are likely the first breads that humans tasted, we still don't know where all the microorganisms come from. There's a little bit of a magic to it in that we know more about the animal species that live in far off jungles than the microscopic creatures that are in the sourdoughs born from our kitchen. So part of the work that we want to do is about understanding some of those mysteries. Where are these microorganisms coming from when we make a starter? Are they coming from our hands? Are they coming from the dust? Are they coming from the grain? To answer some of these big questions, we ask people to share their love of sourdough with us, and specifically to send us they're sourdough pets. So this is a map that seems quite complementary to the Paratos map. And while they have done a fantastic job of keeping these sourdoughs alive and also really gaining a better perspective of the flavors and other aspects of the sourdough, we're taking a parallel path where we're asking them to send us the sourdough so that we can do genetic sequencing on them en masse with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of samples. And by having these hundreds of samples, we can start to get clearer about the origin of the microorganisms. The first thing that we do when people send us their sourdough, besides lovingly transfer its name into a database, is work with the lab of Benjamin Wolf at Tufts University and his graduate student, Liz Landis. And there, they're culturing out the microorganisms that are in each one of those sourdoughs. Sometimes it's a few species, sometimes it's many. The second thing that we do is use next generation sequencing, which allows us to get millions and millions of DNA sequences from these samples, and finally catalog all of the species that exist in each one of these sourdoughs. By having these sequences, we can use predictive analytics and the big data of sourdough. And this allows us to understand things like 
when one or two species won't produce a sourdough on their own, but together they will. This is a simplified version of what that looks like. A couple species on their own can't make a sourdough, but together they can. Except what it looks like when you have real microbial data sets is something more like this. Many species interacting differently to create different flavors, tastes, and textures. Besides using network analyses, we want to get that full list of species, even those cryptic species that might only be in a few sourdoughs in the world, but that might have a disproportionate effect on flavor. To understand what can make a fruity sourdough versus a tart one. Ultimately, we want to build a database where we can understand what microorganisms, what bouquet of microorganisms, can create particular flavors and traits in sourdough. Because you can imagine a future in which if you want a final sourdough with a certain suite of traits, textures, flavors, and aromas, you can get a bespoke mixture of microorganisms that will produce that, again with the help of the baker, because the baker really is the artist in this, bringing the microbes into their final being. So our work involves different aspects of looking in new places and old places for wild microorganisms that can offer new bread traits. And we hope to gain a little bit of insight into the mysteries of sourdough along the way, along with the help of all of the citizen scientists throughout the globe who've sent us samples. And we do this again because we're scientists, we're explorers, but also because we love bread. And we want to live in a world with a greater diversity of those bread flavors. Because rest assured, someday in the future, there's going to be a bread conference. And it's going to start with someone saying something like, imagine if you lived back in 2017, and your breads came from just a few species of yeast. Imagine what you were missing. Thank you. OK, so that leaves us some time for questions and answers. And I'm hoping many of you will, will have some good questions for Ann. Um, we, we got the foundation going. We've got a question right here. Hi, first off, thank you. Uh, the great speech. Really enjoyed that. Um, I was just questioning, I'm, uh, I'm a baker. Is the yeast that you guys are testing and producing, is that available to people to produce in a bakery at this time? Or do, is it, is, uh, yeah, just how do, how do we get kind of that ball rolling? It is, it is. So I mean, you can send me an, an email and I can put you in contact with the right people at the university. But um, rather than just this being me preaching about the yeast that we have, I think it's important to just think about, ask where your yeast came from. Ask about the diversity of yeast. Someday we will have on our ingredients labels, not just the origin of the grains, but also what yeast you have, what microorganisms are in there. Hold on to that mic if you can, and we'll see if anybody else uh, has some more questions. Uh, and while you're thinking of questions, uh, c would you mind speaking a little bit about uh, some of the projects I read about on your site, like the, uh, the belly button project and things like that? I, th I think there's, there's... It's a good segue. We've talked I, about food, so let's move on let's to talk belly buttons. About, I know that <laughs> we're, we're far enough away from lunch now. Let's talk about belly buttons. I'll so um, our lab does a lot of different seemingly unrelated research projects. Um, and they span from everything about knowing about the innermost workings of the microbes in your belly button, to what microbes are growing in your shower, to what bugs live in your home. So there are the gross things, and then there are the food things. We're also interested in the microorganisms associated with grains. Many of these projects are linked in that they are looking about our urban or even our home environment and the diversity that exists therein. Not only just assessing what this diversity is, but how we can use this diversity to uh, provide new tools. Uh, if you look at the Rob Dunn Lab website, we often have citizen scientist projects where you can help us in this expedition of exploration. Um, I think that we've shut down take collecting samples of sourdough, but the mysteries of your shower are actually pretty fascinating, so <laughs> look in there. So, and what did we find in, in, in those? In, in some of those studies, uh, are, are we finding 
beneficial microorganisms or are they scary, the micro, scary microbes or what? And, and do they have applications in the world of food? Less in your shower. I'm, I'm going to pull the shower away from the sourdough. Um, the starters there, yeah. Although occasionally in our like talks with media, it's been the shower dough study because we keep the shower don't dough. name studies with S's in the same yeah. time span. Um, so there are, let's see, some of the research that we do is at the exploration stage where we're trying to figure out what species exist. And so just to think last year, one of our studies was using DNA technology to understand what bugs live in your home through just a Q-tip swipe of dust. And this, we get a lot of media attention about it where it's like, oh, there are bugs taking over your house and everyone wants to like bleach themselves. But that's not really the story. The story is that we live in these jungles and just like jungles can be scary when you don't know about them, but when you visit, it's a world of possibility and new smells and new fruits and new experiences. And that's what we find with the microscopic world as well. And so remember that the exciting patent pending brewing yeast, it came from a hornet's nest. So these were bugs where I used to collect them and I'd post on Craigslist, like free wasp removal. They're pests, but they also lead to some of the best beer we've ever had. So. Not everything is gross upon further exploration. Wolfgang. Yeah, hi. Uh, when I look at this, the bread there, what do you think? How much of the flavor comes from the crane and how much from the yeast? That's a great question. I know more of the statistics with relation to beer than I do with bread. Um, and I would say that it's impossible for me to generalize because there are as many different types of bread and types of grain going into that bread. Um, for beer, you can get about 50% of the flavor and aroma coming from yeast. Um, what we do often is have petri plates of the different yeast growing, and then allow people to smell them. Not like the bread, but like from a safe distance. Um, and you can smell them even from a few feet away. Certain yeasts don't have a lot of smell if you grow them out. And then certain ones smell just really floral or really fruity. And then we make a food product or a beverage product with that yeast and then allow people to drink it and taste it. And that's when you see people light up because they're like, I did not believe your science before, but I trust my nose. And that's where you can, you can detect those chemicals coming through, those natural chemicals that are coming from the original yeast. Do you make the same product with another yeast to get the other, the other flavor? Do we compare? Yep. Okay. Yes, yes. So in making these uh, discussions, like the, the brewing yeast is very different than the bread yeast, but when we're comparing it to what's available on the market, we tend to, to use a standard yeast as a surrogate to detect whether it is the baking process, whether it is the grain, other aspects of... Like scientists do. Like scientists are want to do with controls and stuff. So I'm familiar with um, finding yeast on fruits and vegetables and things that are already out in uh, your yard or your garden. But I'm really curious to know more about how to kind of design a trap to, outside of capturing bees, um, I don't think I want to do that, but are there other ways that we could be trying to find yeast? Yeah, so this is a complicated answer in that I want the world to share in the fun of finding wild yeast because it's awesome. I mean, you, you go from nothing to feeling like there's spontaneous life to having the spontaneous life create a better food product. But in the wild, some yeasts are not good for us. Um, when people are historically uh, selecting for certain yeasts, a very narrow set of yeasts, they're typically harnessing them when they have a larger amount of alcohol in that fermentation product. And that's great because it's keeping out other microorganisms. And you pretty much know that those microorganisms that can withstand that much alcohol and that fermentation, they're good for us. They're not going to create a problem, most likely. But when you start to step back from that, the, the wild that exists before you get to that more alcoholic environment, then 
there's a lot of microorganisms out there, and there's ones that you really don't want to be eating. Uh, and so when it comes to something like isolating bug yeast at home, nobody has the lab safety equipment that I know of um, to be able to do that in a way that I can safely advocate for. Um, but it's a great thing to keep thinking about because I want to make that happen in the future. We have many wild yeast wranglers in the world that can all contribute to some massive biobank. Like, for instance, if, like for instance, the work that, that Mike is doing with these breads, would you be able to actually identify through by getting samples of his starters and his final bread, what organisms he, he was able to trap and draw to make these bread and validate whether or not uh, each of these breads are very different, even though they were made you know, in the same bakery? Definitely. And then the, the fun part is also being able to isolate that yeast strain so that, because um, whenever you're back slopping and things like that, you're, you might have the community shift a little or what microorganism is, is working might become a different microorganism over time. And so um, being able to isolate that yeast allows you to go back to it every time to produce the same kind of product. Um, I don't know exactly his strategy for trapping the yeast, but I'm guessing it has to do with that um, creating the right environment for certain yeast and then creating an environment where only those yeast are flourishing. And so that will bring certain microorganisms um, to a higher abundance but I, without knowing more about yeah, what he's I mean, up to. Yeah, I don't know the full thing. And I, I'm hoping that he'll can connect with you, but just as an example, his theory being that all these organisms are living around us, many of them, and, and that is, is it, does it make sense even, does it hold water, so to speak, that, that you could draw certain ones of those strains towards your starter by leading it there through particular baits? Yeah, so I mean, so the story of microbiology in terms of, of how we isolate and how we enrich is, is really the story of fermentation. And it's about, um, there's sort of no magic. So the microorganisms that exist around us are going to be seeded into this environment. And then by creating different sugars in there, different scenarios of how acidic it is, how much oxygen there are, certain species are going to do well versus others. And it's the same thing as if you were to take a whole bunch of animal species from the globe, shake it all up, and then put them in the desert. Like polar bear is not going to reproduce. But certain animals that live in the desert that I wish I could mention right now, I'm the worst animal biologist in the world, um, desert animals will survive and do well. <laughs> uh, off the cuff metaphors. Um, and so it's a little bit like that with you're, you're setting up a habitat for certain groups of microorganisms. So when we have a sourdough starter that fails and starts getting fluffy and rotten, it's just because the habitat has selected for a different group of microorganisms and we don't want that end habitat. We don't want a fuzzy, mildewy thing. That's not our goal. We're trying to shift away from a desert to a jungle type environment. Not sure that completely answered it, but ask me follow-up questions later. So the assertion has been made for a long time that if you take a starter from Providence to um, Providence, Rhode Island, down to Charlotte, or move it around, it becomes um, typical of that local yeast and beneficial bacteria. So do you agree with that? And or can you elaborate on how you would keep a strain of a special yeast starter pure without having it become populated with other local yeasts? So two questions. I think that we're, we're hopefully with the bigger data sets of sourdoughs. Um, we also have stories of where these sourdoughs came from. And we'll hopefully be able to get a little bit more at that how stable the communities are as people move around and are feeding them differently and things like that. Um, suggestions, though, I, I don't because I think sometimes the question is not just who the species are, but you're interested in the functional traits of that community. So you, you're really asking, can I get the same sourdough from this community as I move? Or even if you had three distinct different yeast culture starters, mm -hmm. how you would not have them all become more similar if they were in the same facility, like a bakery, not a lab? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think actually that rather than talking to a scientist about, like, I can tell you about aseptic technique and, and how that would work, 
I'm going to punt that question to bakers um, because I think that that's where more of the experience comes in about how do you do that. And uh, rather than suggest that I'm the authority on that, I'm sure there's someone else in this audience who can answer it better about how to successfully do that. Okay, thanks. All right, now this is kind of a weird question because I'm not actually baker, I'm chef. So it's just a different kind of world. Um, but I'm really into fermenting things and doing like kimchi and nuka and stuff like that. Have you guys looked into different lactic acids and different lactobacillus into fermenting specifically? Or is it all just kind of one generic organism that goes throughout it in order to make that ferment happen? You're asking like a time series about what... Well, I'm asking if there's multiple different organisms that can be used in different types of fermentation. So like, is there another lactic acid that you could use or a different type of acid that you could use? Because I've made a lot of kimchi using things like whey or salt or stuff like that. But I want to try and get away from using specifically lactose to try and get it more so everyone can eat it. Because they, you don't like the acids associated with it, or well, it's just because a lot of people, I, I, a lot of people, if I use whey, like curds and whey, and I know what you're thinking, no way. Um, <laughs> um, if I use that, a vegetarian can't eat it. Oh, you mean like the lactose? The, yeah. The, okay. Um, yes, there are different ways of constructing that environment so that you're harnessing similar microorganisms. Yeah. Um, have you guys started looking into that specifically, or are you just doing beer and bread for right now? We do bread and we do beer and textiles and bugs and many other things. So um, we, there is a diversity of microorganisms that can produce the lactic acids, which I think is partially what you're interested in. Um, and I sort of recommend going to the Baratos um, sourdough library and looking at the different microorganisms that they have already listed that are in <laughs> sourdoughs because, I mean, different sourdoughs are going to have different flavors, but they do a really good job of kind of describing yeah. some of that diversity. And it holds true for other systems as well. And so it's kefir. There's other groups working on kefir and the different microbial species that are involved in that. Um, not a really good answer. I guess in the future, I mean, you can you can culture these microorganisms and then add them. Yeah, well, that's why I'm asking, because you said we have hundreds of thousands of different types of yeast. I'm just wondering if there's different organisms that we can use. But if you guys haven't quite looked into that yet, then that's something that we could potentially do in the future. Yeah, yeah. So we work in conjunction with Ben Wolf's lab, and Ben Wolf is more like cheese and kombucha. And then he's looking at some of the strains and then trying to look at the genetic mechanism that's basically uniting these systems. And so there are researchers involved in it, yes. So eventually we might be able to do something like a kimchi that tastes like fruity instead of acidic. That's yeah, awesome, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what I was looking for, so we can change the way that we do things. Yeah, yeah, or ask the industry people here. I mean, like they have great scientists too doing some of this work, so. Thank you very much. Yeah. I had a question. You talked about the complex ecosystem of the microorganisms and um, the interactions between microorganisms. Can you give some examples of what that means in a, in a bread dough or in a sourdough? And then also my other question is, how do you study that? In what system? Is that in a, a lab environment or do you evaluate the interactions in, in a bread dough system? So what I was speaking to there was more um, looking at network analysis in terms of co-occurrence patterns and co-occurrence with relative abundance. And so you're getting a hint towards what species are clustering together. And then you can use targeted experiments to be able to understand how that relates to taste and flavor. Does that give a better? So the first step is using all the sequencing data to be able to understand when you typically see species clumped together, when they're not just alone, but there are certain groups of them. But that's only a like map to find the next. And, th and the next step would be which ones break down sugars and then the others take advantage and kind of synergistic systems that's, or symbiotic systems, that's, that would be the next step. Yeah. You study these as well or that would be? We can, the first step is to identify them and see if they're of interest. Okay. 
Um, and sometimes they're known and sometimes they're not known, right? So we wouldn't have thought that yeast could be capable of producing that lactic acid. And so it's a little bit about the assumptions of what we think each organism is doing and then being able to mine that, not only what they're potentially capable of, but what they are actually capable of. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, is that a question? Do you want to have a question? Well, I, oh, pardon me. Another, uh, if you could pass the mic down. And while the mic's down, let me ask, uh, let me ask you a question that's come to my mind. You mentioned earlier, and I, you may have touched on this at the beginning of the talk, but uh, some of the, what are some of the other uh, uh, insects or, or places that you're looking for new strains of yeast to, or new strains of microorganisms? What are that's some of the things that we did, that we haven't cited today that you're that you're you know, you're, you're mining for these uh, organisms? It depends on what we're going after. Um, and so there are other members of our research team who are interested in microorganisms that can break down, particularly recalcitrant substances, so cellulose and things like that. And they're going towards different insects that often feed on those recalcitrant substances in the world and then targeting them. So maybe the microorganisms within their digestive tract are the source of these better enzymes or more useful enzymes. So, so that kind of so it's so you you identify the say the insects by looking at what the insects are feeding on or or cr what kind of byproducts they're creating and things like that. Is that is that sort of the map that gets you there? Mm, um, so how did you decide on the wasp, for instance, and find that that yeast in that wasp? So. <laughs> So we use a lot of information to be able to target the microorganisms. And one part of that is understanding a little bit about the ecology and evolution of these microorganisms. And so other groups have found that certain wild yeasts were identified in wasps. And these were wild yeasts that are used for certain types of wine. Now, wine yeast are very different than beer yeast and all these things, but we thought, okay, let's dive deeper into the diversity of the yeast that might be in these insects. And there seems to be a relationship that's playing out with insects, and particularly yeasts, where they might both benefit in that the wasps act like aircraft carriers, bringing them to different locations of sugar in the world, and then keeping them safe in the winter when there isn't a lot of available sugar. Because yeasts are just have incredible sweet tooths. And so if you ever have a lot of sugar in the wild, you'll, you'll find yeast. And we know that because if you remember back to college days and there was a party and there was spilled yeah. sugary substances the next morning, you can smell the yeast, right? That fermentation on the ground. You can it, find wasps too. <laughs> right. So you're onto it. Yeah. And so wasps, through part of their life, feed on sugar as well. During the early part of their colony cycle, early summer, they're after caterpillars, and so people always ask me, like, what good is a wasp? Like, number one, they make better beer. Number two, they're killing your caterpillars. And so if you're a gardener, if you're a farmer, you actually love wasps because they're eating all of those caterpillars. But like halfway through the summer, they switch into a different mode, and they want sugar. They want carbohydrates to store up. And so that's when you start to see them a lot on flowers and a lot on grapes and fruit and orchards and things like that old sodas at a picnic. And so the idea is that they just want to find sugar in the world. And one way they might be doing this is by smelling it. But they're not smelling the sugar, they're smelling the yeast that are feeding on the sugar. And the yeast, they suck at moving in space. They're tiny, they can't fly. So if that little pool of sugar that they're on, whether it's a grape, whether it's a drop of soda, that's going to be gone soon. So in order for them to survive, their progeny to survive, they need to get somewhere else. And one way they might be able to get there is by a wasp. And the truly magic part that a different group of researchers found out was that in the winter, this is when it's really hard to find yeast because there's no available sugar anywhere. In the winter, you can find yeast inside the bodies of wasps that are hibernating. So yes, wasps hibernate. First fun fact, if you take nothing else from this talk, like that's Pretty cool, right? They're like bears. And inside these wasps are yeast that are also hanging out, waiting for the next summer when they'll be dropped on a new grape or a new orchard, and then they get to flourish. And so that was sort of the, the start of why wasps and why other insects. And it seems to be a more common pattern that we've all kind of been 
delightfully ignorant of for life. And final question from Wolfgang Mack. Not a, not a question, but uh, maybe another view on the microorganism. A German research uh, center um, compared carrots. Yeah? And uh, one carrot had uh, close to 40 different flavor building substances, and the other one less than 10. What was the difference? One was fed by men, by fast food, conventional farming. And the other one was fed by the microorganism you know, in the earth, organic farming. That's the difference. Yeah? The microorganism helped the plant to build all the flavors, like here in the bread. Huh? And our fast food for the plants didn't help to produce more than 10 flavor-building substances. Yeah? Yes. And that's organic farming. That's the difference. Yeah. There you go. Microorganism. Well, that's an, that, and that's a really good example of connecting the dots, which is what we're all about here, is connecting the dots of these ideas. So uh, I, I want to thank Ann Madden. Thank you so much for your presentation, for being here. You can, you can reach her through, I think her contact info, info is in the abstract and in her bio, um, and you can track her uh, via the, uh, her projects, the Rob Dunn Project, and also uh, keep an eye out for her TED Talks.